So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Paul and I'm the Business Development Manager here for Australia and New Zealand at Unity. And I'm sure that you'll all agree that Unity is the world's leading real-time 3D engine, especially when it comes to creating mixed reality experiences. So I'm joined here with uh, my colleague, Marek, who's a Unity evangelist and assisting with this webinar, as well as answering any technical questions that you might have towards the end of today's presentation. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in Zoom. Unfortunately, we're unable to see questions that are posted in YouTube. So please remember to only use Zoom for your questions. Uh, we'll bring them up at the end of the presentation uh, to be answered by our guests, as well as by Marek. And yes, this session will be recorded. We will post it on YouTube so that you'll be able to revisit and share with your friends and work colleagues that couldn't make it today. Uh, so today, our friends at Crumo are sharing their tips and tricks on how they create VR-based training for heavy machinery. I was first introduced to the team at Crumo almost six months ago and was instantly impressed with their caliber of work and virtual training scenarios. Their VR training has proven to significantly improve their customers' reliance on operational stock, such as trains, which has been reduced by 50%. Meanwhile, the efficiency of their training has more than doubled. I look forward to the presentation and learning more about their workflow. So now without further ado, it's time to turn the microphone over to the talented team at Crumo. Are you guys saying something? You're live. Yeah, we're, we're ready to queue. Today, uh, the objective of our webinar is to present how we use at uh, Crumo uh, Unity 3D for a range of training solutions. So I'll take you through the agenda first. Um, first of all, it's me talking about Crumo and why we use Unity 3D. Um, then we'll move on to, again, me uh, talking about Unity 3D for design and prototyping, sort of the initial journey and the framework around the project. Then we move on to our lead dev, Nick Mander who will um, talk about the tools we designed for the job and how they're implemented. And then we'll move to Brett Weissman, who will be talking about the magic of the 3D assets and scenes and using complex assets. And then we'll move to a, uh, a little uh, demo of some of the work we've done using one of our videos and a time for questions, if everything goes right. So, at Crumo, we make amazing. That's uh, that's kind of the slogan we go by. And Unity 3D plays a pivotal part in that as a real-time engine. So as um, as you may know, or Skalk introduced, uh, we, uh, we offer a range of digital learning services ranging from e-learning, emergency training, video production, and XR. Now, Unity as, an, uh, as a real-time engine really allows us to cover all those bases and make material for um, those services, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so we use in Unity 3D for uh, specifically for our latest VR projects and XR projects. Um, just before that, I just want to give a plug to how much fun it is to uh, to create um, and develop with Unity for training. I mean, I've got a background in gaming and 
creating games with a small team is a lot of fun, especially with a highly motivated and driven people. And I think working with Unity and small, um, even large scale projects, you generally only need a relatively small team. And that, that is just a lot of fun to work with these type of projects, very similar to approach to uh, developing for games. Um, for any of the uh, aspiring uh, game developers out there, uh, don't discount training. Um, so why do we use Unity? Well, incredibly strong community support, of course, uh, very active. So if, uh, any, if there are any problems, there's a lot of support out there. Um, and the multi-platform deployment is one of my, uh, my, my biggest favorites, um, being able to deploy to about 26 platforms speaks for itself. I mean, being able to go from mobile to HTML5 to VR to XR, it's, uh, it's amazing. Very much future proof. And then uh, the ability to uh, create so many um, outputs. So in the initial stages, when we, we just have a client brief, um, we're looking at what framework are we going to design and what framework are we going to use, framework of functionality, components, and solutions. And um, at an early stage, we try and visualize concepts uh, as soon as possible. So, so my area really is the rapid prototyping. And I've, I love Unity as a rapid prototyping tool, even though it's also a total um, uh, end product publication tool, and high end tool. Um, so I try and take the clients as, as quick as possible into this world of uh, how we're going to solve things. So for the client, for instance, we, we were working with these trains and locomotives and we had these, uh, how, are we, how are we going to couple these hoses and so on? And what will that look like? Um, we're kind of on the front edge of uh, learning design here, working with, with XR. So I didn't have much reference much areas to go to looking at games, but you can't really put a game in front of a client. So we had to build all these examples ourselves of how are we going to solve this thing? Like this works like that in the real world, but how does it work in a virtual world? So we, we, we make these um, prototypes and for that quite often, we also use visual scripting. Um, I especially, um, a little bit frowned, of, frowned upon by some of our developers here, but um, visual scripting tool is really strong and you can use Bolt or you can use Playmaker for that. And what it allows is to rapidly take code components and prototype something together, you know, sticky tape it together, uh, even though you can take it to a final product, it's, it's strong enough. There's no, no problem with visual scripting. Um, but of course, at some point we take it, we, we, we design something with visual script and then um, our developers will look at it and say, okay, I can optimize that further, we maybe get more out of it and code specific custom made solutions around that. <clears throat> so what we see here is an image of um, a very early stage, our, uh, our host solution, trying to figure out like how do these hoses actually work and connect, what will it look like? And then we, we have an image here of um, the wagons next to each other with, um, with that spatially. So um, we can already jump, jump into that in VR. And I'll just show you some footage of that happening in VR and the process to get to that. Inside a prototype here, one of the early stages, you can see that we had the gray box wagon there. And we had actually some photogrammetry. So that was scans made in the field. And I particularly like this scene because um, you can see that, that realism. Fun thing seeing these prototypes like a year later or so is uh, how, uh, how close these prototypes are to the final result as well. I'll put in a few of these animating items here to look at. Very great fun to see this at scale. And there's no way in explaining this without actually being in VR. It's so much more efficient than sending a video. The, uh, the lever, the manually unlocking and opening, so the user would do that and later on in the project does that. Now these also really help the developers to explain what needs to happen. So when we're in a prototyping phase, sort of look at all these items and build a functionality. We can tell, we can explain it very easily to a developer, say, okay, this is, this is what it needs to do and so on.
Oh, you can see I can manipulate all these items there. See some real beautiful physics behavior there. Both these things, some more connecting happening. Even though it's virtual, this is just sticking your hand in there is just, uh, you can't do it. So here I'm in an early, early stage prototype space for the cabin. Yes, we used images initially here, but later on we've totally built this whole uh, computer system. I think this might already be a step in between, but it's partially functional. And we see the lever, um, it just shows you, you can manipulate all the system. So this is a nice little testing ground for, uh, for showing what the cabin will look like. The next bit is about designing your project. And this is from going from a higher level um, and designing a scalable framework because um, there's a huge uptake in XR and we need to be able to, to, to service more than uh, yeah, multiple clients, of course. And the key to that is, uh, of course, uh, creating frameworks and components that are very scalable and um, ensure that everybody, every discipline within your business talks the same language as well. So, and that's from design to development to um, publication stage. And also this includes the journey for the client. So the, so the client needs to be able to understand the same language. So do the developers, so do the 3D artists, so does management and so on. So before this, we designed a step system for scene management. And in that we go, we basically go through how you would read a book and you would take a chapter and you go through that. Well, it's sort of similar approach. So I'll show an image here and it's a step-by-step -step system. We call this our step system for short and there's main steps and each main step has a single objective. So let's say I need to apply a handbrake. Well, that's a good example of a main step and that might take you a minute to do. It might take you two minutes to do, but the objective around that one particular learning point is uh, that's a main step. And you may have an activity that only you know, generally on average has 20 to 25 main steps. It might take the user 20 minutes or 25 minutes to get through. And that is, that it, I'd say that's a very solid module. That's, that's something nice to aim for. I mostly say that to guys, hey guys, let's, let's aim for 25 main steps here. Now, there's a lot of actions within those main steps. So you might have a panel that appears and you might have to teleport and so on. So those are all individual actions, but some of those are global and that's what we call blocks. So when you get a whole block of maybe an inspection and the same seven steps happen over and over again, that's what we call global block. So now you have this scaffold going from main step number one and you get presented with an instruction panel and then you get a communication block and we'll see this in action in a moment is that's how we flow through this thing. Once you've completed it, you go on to the next step. Let me just show you an example of that. So I'm in uh, one of the Shantyard scenes and the activity is a coupling activity. Let's see, I'm in the Unity editor at the moment and here's our visual scripting for this particular project. So it's a Playmaker visual scripting solution of the main steps. Let's move a few steps in, see if we can find something interesting. So um, there's a checking, checking of the handbrakes, for instance. So step number four, so I can easily find that um, can relate to the storyboards and the dev sheets and, um, and everything, you know, easy discussion to have. Also when we're reviewing it, we say, right, we're at step number 4.2 and we need to do something there. And right there is a start of a wagon break inspection. So you see here, this is a custom action in that area. It's assigned a particular controller, that one. So I can probably find that in the scene as well. Let's jump to that. There it is, beauty. So that particular action related to this little item over here. And um, to show the visual inspector there again. So yeah, so we've, uh, we further improved that as well. And we're now at a, at a stage where we can uh, go through these steps in the editor and uh, adjust, make adjustments while we're, uh, we're going through these steps. So you see a few more actions here working with arrays as well. So all the text gets delivered two panels through arrays. And um, so you have one place to, uh, to change all the text, which is quite neat. Um, 
I mean, in very initial situations, you have to go to every single individual panel and change the text at that panel. So obviously you want to move away from that. And then finally, just a little bit on uh, designing UI for Unity VR projects. And uh, I'm, uh, I've become really passionate about this. Um, it's been such an interesting challenge um, for me. It's so different to designing UI for, let's say, PowerPoint presentation or a mobile phone or for an e-learning course with Storyline or for a website. Uh, there's a lot of similar principles. Uh, but it's sort of, it's, it was a whole new learning journey trying to apply these things in 360. So suddenly you're in a simulation of the real world and in the real world, panels don't suddenly appear in front of you unless you're wearing like a HoloLens or something like that. So how are we going to solve that? And how are we going to differentiate between instructional panels? So I need to understand what I need to do here right now. Uh, as opposed to a panel that might give me information and then to find out that you don't want to be doing a lot of reading in VR. So they need to be you know, at a certain scale and they need to suit your resolution of your headset and so on. So initially we placed every single panel one by one. And uh, you can see here on the left, there's a, there's a bit of a framework image there. Um, so I'll start off with, uh, with, we start off with Illustrator. We designed these panels and the, one of the iterations there was to design a whole panel set. So to go away from having to place each version of a panel individually within the scene and they're fixed there. Then we work to a panel set and these, these panels appear where the user is and right in front of them. And we can manipulate the orientation of that and so on and what's displayed on that panel and the type of panel set. Uh, you see here a, um, a little, what we call prefab. So that's um, prefab and shows um, what panels there are. It's just highlighting and you, know, so at that point of the, the teleport point, we can bring up what an, every, any panel you need. Uh, lately, I've, uh, for my design, I've been using a lot of Adobe XD as well, and uh, that allows us to pre-design a lot of animation, and we're bringing the animation back into Unity, uh, mostly um, how you work between a, a design program and Unity is that you port a lot of the, um, the assets and the colors and things like icons and graphics and so on, and that you use your design program for reference on sizing and so on. And I've, uh, I've lately found Adobe XD to work really well with that. And I'll just show you a bit of an example of, of that design and that in action. Um, some of the stuff you can't do in real life. And one of the things you can't do in real life is actually to pull out a bogey. Now, you do find them in the yards sometimes, but you can't you know, get them to uh, hang in midair and take them apart. So that's unique we were exploring sort of what that would look like and um, client was always very impressed at seeing this sort of stuff and also like, how will we solve things like inform information labels very early stage of looking at that. see my two helpers there um, having a good look at the bogey over there so Shola, what are you looking at now? Uh, this scene was more built for, uh, for using and, and collecting all these assets and items and testing them out, more so than uh, user testing these, but uh, more for design as this. Some very early versions. You see here that, that one of the areas where we started is uh, from existing material, from PowerPoints and e-learning material, their material literally looks like that. And we, we would start kind of in that type of area. So we would start at what material do you have? And now let's start translating that style into a virtual world. And that, that's a really good starting point to go from, uh, from your slideshows and that material to these sort of versions of instruction panels. And then finally, we sort of end up with these sort of items and assets that were used in VR. And now it's time to move on to Nick Monder. He's uh, our lead developer, and he'll be talking about developing tools for the job.
Hi everyone, my name is Nick and I'm the lead Unity developer at Cremo. In my part of the presentation today, I'm going to cover a selection of solutions that we've developed for VR training applications. The three topics I will cover today include how we implemented functionality to control the position and movement of trains for a training solution, how we use scriptable objects to organize data, and finally, how we implemented a step system to manage progression through an activity. To start on the topic of train movement, for one of our clients, Horizon, we needed to develop a training solution to teach their new recruits the procedures of working in a train shunt yard. A VR solution was chosen here as it was deemed a great fit to simulate the interactions that were required to learn as part of their training. Being a train company, the trains are without a doubt a centerpiece of their training application. So it was very important that we got this part right. When scoping out the solution, it was immediately obvious that trains are quite complex due to all the internet interconnected parts. So how do we go about solving the solution? The first saving grace is that we didn't need to develop a physics simulation. From past experiences, physics can be something really difficult to get right in Unity. Realistically, it was far too risky to develop this solution given our resources at the time. With this technicality ruled out, we now we needed a solution to position the train along the track. The obvious choice here was to use splines. Splines are essentially a mathematical curve construct that maps the path in 3D space. From there, we are then able to evaluate the spline at specific points and calculate the corresponding positions in 3D space. So essentially, this means that positioning all the rail units becomes a one-dimensional problem instead of a three-dimensional problem. This is a great start. The next part of the problem was defining how to join the different parts that make a train together. For this part, we defined a rail vehicle component that managed its position and the size it takes up on the track. This component also defined the rail vehicle that it is dependent on. With all this information, you are now able to programmatically position all the rail vehicles to assemble the train. And finally, to the part of moving the train. This part is actually really easy. Essentially, all you need to do is move each rail vehicle in the train the same amount along the spine. But before we call it a day on our rail vehicle solution, we still need to make sure that each rail vehicle is properly positioned on the track. One problem we needed to account for was turnouts. In other words, a non-straight piece of track. While planes are able to follow the turnout correctly, as you can see in the left screenshot, you can see there is a problem with how the loco is aligned with the track. The loco is positioned on the spline from its center point. However, this solution does not ensure the wheels are also attached to the track. So how do we achieve the result on the right? The solution actually requires you to position the wheels on the spline. When positioned on the spline, they are guaranteed not to come off the track. As you move the vehicle around, you also need to keep the wheels a constant distance apart. Then with the wheels positioned, you line the load between the wheels and then your train stays nicely on the tracks. With that problem resolved, let's take a look at how this solution turned out. The next topic I want to talk about is how we utilize Unity scriptable objects in our workflow. We have used scriptable objects extensively across our projects as a means to organize data. It helps reduce redundancy and it can simplify scene files and prefabs. It is also great for version control. This splits up your data across separate assets and makes it easier to see how your data has changed over time. But what exactly are scriptable objects? To quote Unity's definition, a scriptable object is a data container that you can use to save large amounts of data independent of class instances. So in practice, this means that you create a script that derives from a scriptable object, define properties for that script, and then create instances. These instances are assets that exist within your project assets folder and can be referenced by other mono behavior components and even scriptable object assets. So looking at the example here, the scriptable object inspector is very similar to that of a mono behavior. Like Mono Behaviors, we are able to customize your inspector window to add additional editing functionality. However, as they are designed to only hold data, they are unable to execute any update loops like a Mono Behavior would. So in today's, in today's session, I want to cover two use cases of scriptable objects that we've implemented. These are the conversation config and the speed position config. Starting with the conversation config, in our training applications, we had to implement a dialogue solution for talking to a virtual worker. These are an important part of their training as trainees needed to become familiar with the communication protocols when out in the field. 
Let's take a look at this in action. Triber 0019. This is the single authorized worker. Over. Triber 0019 receiving over. Release. Three step protection. Over. Three step protection released. Over. As the application contains multiple conversations, scriptable objects make a great solution for storing the back and forth dialogue. The great thing about scriptable object solution is that we are able to reuse the same conversation config throughout the project without any duplication. Likewise, if we are required to modify text and audio, we only need to do it in one place rather than multiple places. Taking a closer look at this inspector, you can see we have a customized inspector which displays each entry in the reorderable list. At the top of the inspector, we have added a few different buttons for adding the different types of entries to this list, whether that be a read or a listen entry. To differentiate between the different types of entries, the solution also takes advantage of the new serialized reference feature that enables you to store and serialize different types of data in this list. This, mean that only read, this means that only read entries need to contain the keyword text required by the speech to text solution. Likewise, the listen entries are the only entries that use an audio clip for a voice sample. The second configuration I'm going to discuss today is the speed position config. As you'd expect, the activities require trains to move around. The train movement needs to look somewhat believable to support the learning experience. Animation curves are a great solution to this problem as it can model positions over time. However, given that the information about the train movement is defined as speed or acceleration in real world units, this makes it harder for us to model the, with the curve editor. So we opted to find a better solution to create these curves. This led us to make the speed position config. The config contains a list of actions to calculate speed and position across the duration of movement. The idea is that you string together actions based on actual speed and acceleration data. From this config, we generate an animation curve to move the train in a convincing manner. Like the conversation config, the speed position config also uses a custom inspector. It uses a reorderable list, allowing us to shift the order of the actions. Each action has a set of parameters that you can modify, whether that be distance, time, or speed. Also visible in the inspector are other derived properties. As you modify these properties, all the derived parameters will automatically get recalculated. In addition, when you modify one action, it will also affect all the other actions that come after it. This makes it very useful to see how your changes affect everything else and means it'll be easier to get the movement just right. Finally, the last thing I wanted to discuss today is the step system. The step system is a solution that manages progression through a training activity and allows for a quick progression to specific states or steps of the activity. For well, the first lot of VR projects that we worked on, a huge bottleneck for us was the testing. To test a single step required running the application and completing all the previous steps to get to it. This could be quite a time consuming process if the thing we wanted to test is right at the end of the activity. So for future projects, we knew we wanted a better solution. To make a better solution, we needed to define rules for how we created activities. These include activities are linear, requiring you to complete a list of steps in order. Each step defines a behavior which modifies the state of the environment. Only one step runs at a time. Each step must be completed in order. And if you want to jump between steps, you need to process all the steps in between to ensure the activity is in the correct state. And finally, if you want to move back to a previous step, we need to undo the behavior done in the activity. With these rules in mind, this is what we came up with for the step system solution. The step system requires two core components, the step holder and step action. Step actions are your behaviors, and the step holder manages all these steps and then tracks which step you're up to in the activity. When defining new step actions, we needed them to abide by a template for when you enter and leave the step action. We came up with four different core methods, enter forward, exit forward, enter back, and exit back. The reason we differentiate how you enter and exit the action is so it knows if it needs to apply undo logic or not. So let's take a look at how this applies in practice. For this example, we'll look at the teleport action step. The goal of this step is to move the player to the target teleport point. Let's see what we're trying to achieve. Upon entering the action, we want to activate some setup logics such as enabling teleport controls, as well as activating the teleport we want to move to. On leaving the action, we want to run some cleanup behavior to disable teleporting controls as well as deactivating the teleport point. If we run exit forward, this will automatically complete the action and transport the player to the target teleport point. 
To support undo functionality, we also need to store the initial position. This is done in enter forward where we take the position of the player. We don't do this, however, in enter back as we be, would be setting the initial position with the player's current position, i.e. the target position. Instead, enter back actually positions the player at the initial position that was sent during enter forward. So that was a selection of solutions that we've developed for VR training. Solutions that were necessary to the learning outcomes of the program, but also important internally to improve the workflow of development. It is essential that you invest the time to develop the core systems properly. Good solutions may take longer to develop initially, but will undoubtedly save time and stress later in the product lifecycle. On that note, I will now hand you over to Brett, who will discuss asset creation for VR. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brett Wiseman. I'm 3D lead uh, here at Chromo. Um, typically, I look after 3D production. Uh, it's one of those things where we're always making sure that uh, these assets perform well, but ultimately the right detail is in the right place uh, because some of these assets are quite, and it's quite unnecessary to have that much detail everywhere. Uh, so that's definitely a big part of it. The other part is making sure that uh, these assets are uh, good to look at. And <laughs> while that seems like a, just make it look pretty, uh, there's a lot more to it. So we'll get into that a bit later. Um, so on that note, when it comes to uh, making things look good, we really need to consider budgets. We need to uh, uh, put some guidelines down for our assets. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's going to be really hard later to retro actively uh, optimize this stuff. It's, it's best just to hit the ground running, uh, putting your best foot forward. So when it comes to high-end VR, typically uh, we, we try to limit to one to two million triangles for high-end VR. Uh, that means more your HTC uh, and Oculus uh, Rift type devices connected to a high-end PC. Uh, and then when it comes to mobile VR, we're talking uh, Quest and um, all your other um, mobile devices, we want to chop that right down, probably down to a third, around 350,000 uh, triangles on the screen. And that doesn't take into account uh, any benefits from batching in Unity. Um, I'll mention that a little bit more later, um, but it's something to aim for. If you, don't, if you don't aim for it, you're gonna shoot way past it and it'll be harder later. So on that, um, some general tips for when you're getting into modeling for, for VR uh, is, Typically, uh, a few golden rules that don't really change um, across most VR projects. So you want to check your scale. Uh, if the scale is off, you can spot it super easy inside VR. Um, you have two eyes, and you can really critically analyze these things up close. On that note, texture quality needs to hold up. So when you're a few inches away from something, as you can see here, it's, it's a close-up. Uh, we're only a few inches from the side of this bogey. The detail. Uh, and the texture resolution needs to, to be there to support that. Um, otherwise, you're going to get eye strain trying to focus on something that it just doesn't have the detail to, to look at. Uh, Z fighting is super obvious and it'll give you a bit of a headache if you have to put up with that for too long. Uh, avoid at all costs. This comes down to either your artists having double up faces uh, or meshes too close together, or perhaps your LOD groups aren't working. So uh, don't let those things uh, go by the wayside, catch them if you can. Um, and then of course, the LODs themselves. If your LODs are dropping in quality uh, too dramatically between LODs, it will become very obvious and distracting. It'll break immersion, all that kind of stuff inside VR. So um, carefully craft your LODs or uh, avoid them if you can. If you know where you're going to teleport, then you can just control the detail. You don't really need LODs, but uh, that's where you've probably got to cooperate with your devs to make sure that it's only showing the right detail at the right teleport. Uh, we've got a few um, solutions like that in the works as well. And then of course, optimizing your materials. Um, you can get a lot more detail and it'll really uh, help, I suppose, the quality that you're seeing in VR. If you can increase that resolution and uh, ultimately use as fewer textures as possible. Um, and they can be higher res textures, but um, yeah, we can get a lot of mileage out of, out of well-optimized materials if we do them right. So a bit more on that uh, next. 
On the, the topic of optimizing, um, this is a constant battle when it comes to any real-time application. VR is particularly uh, brutal when it comes to performance. So we really want to hit that uh, 10 millisecond latency, um, which is around your 90, 100 frames a second. So really, uh, there's a few, few points here. I won't uh, go through them all, but at the end of the day, we really have to reduce the amount of chatter um, and, and work that the CPU is sending the GPU. Uh, so there's just a few questions there you can ask. But ultimately, it does sometimes come down to designing a custom shader that might help you do that. And probably the biggest one is, if you could, in an ideal world, uh, have one VR scene with one mesh using one material and one texture set, that's, that's a huge win for your draw calls. Uh, there's not much work going on there. But in the real world, you've got to balance lots of different objects. They're moving. Uh, some are static, all that kind of stuff. So there's no hard and fast rule for this kind of stuff, uh, but these are some really great questions to ask yourself when it comes to um, reducing your draw calls. Uh, lots of great content online as well for uh, how to understand and minimize your draw calls. On that, um, we've found huge benefits uh, to using these materials and models in prefabs. Um, it's one of those things where you can assemble and manage huge amounts of assets. I have a, a little demo video for you uh, very shortly after this. But uh, ultimately, there are so many wins that it's, it's, it's a no-brainer um, not to use prefabs uh, in Unity, let alone VR. Um, when it comes to heavy industrial equipment, we've got lots of different ways uh, and, and lots of different assets, lots of different processes and animations that need to be grouped, lots of different pivots to manage. Um, we're pushing all of this through Git. So uh, anything we can do to reduce the, the size of the binary files through little prefab pushes and things like that, we're going to do it. Um, not to mention that we just collaborate faster. We can have devs in the scene, what we call scene side, artists in prefabs or prefab side, uh, ultimately working on the same thing, just not pushing the same stuff through Git. So it's really powerful, it's really modular. Uh, so we'll cue that video and I'll, I'll just narrate it. Cool, so uh, here we have me navigating down through the levels of prefabs. As you can see, uh, it's much like a hierarchy, except you're nesting these prefabs. And then you can just drop any new material, make a change, add an object. Uh, you can save it automatically, or you can save it manually. And then you just propagate that through. And there might be hundreds of these uh, wagons, bogies, and wheels. But at the end of it, you've pushed a, a change all the way through, and I haven't done anything scene side. Uh, on that, textures and lighting. Uh, this is going to be a little different for everyone, of course, depending on your needs for training or, or the game that you're building. Uh, but ultimately, it was a no-brainer for us to go with the universal render pipeline, um, mainly because it already had everything we needed dialed in uh, to, to get us most of the way. We could use um, PBR textures uh, through Substance. Um, we went light on reflections, but uh, ultimately, it was a great, great little... Um, set up we had uh, straight out of the box for, for Universal Render Pipeline. Uh, in terms of shaders and textures, as I said, we push a lot of it through Substance. Um, ultimately, Substance, again, gets us there quickly when it uh, comes to more realistic um, and, I suppose, uh, yeah, the, the, the subtleties of a material we can get very quickly through Substance. But we coupled that with Shader Graph. And as soon as Unity released Shader Graph, uh, we, we had to start looking into it because we could design our own shaders very quickly uh, as artists. Um, and so that, that gives us a lot of power, especially when Shader Graph then lets us access channels within a texture. So I'll have a demo shortly. Uh, but ultimately, it means that instead of using three textures, what we call hero uh, textures for hero assets, that's unique textures that only work on specific models. As we could get away from that, 
we could start to then use generic Atlas channel packed textures. And we got a lot of power out of that. Um, so it goes without saying that if you can reduce your textures, well, you're going to reduce your build sizes. You're going to increase your memory bandwidth. You'll have more memory to play with. Um, your material counts ideally go down, as do your textures. It's just there's so many wins, and you will ideally gain texture or surface fidelity and detail. So, um, yeah, if you haven't looked into Shader Graph or um, you haven't looked into designing your own shaders to for specific scenarios, I would highly recommend it. Um, let's cue that video. So we're here in the uh, virtual shunt yard. And uh, in this case, I'm just zooming in on the side of a bogey, which is the, just the, the wheel uh, assembly of a wagon. And right now, it's got three of those hero textures um, applied. You can see I'm toggling that on and off. Ultimately, I don't want to use three unique textures per model. So I'm going to pack a mask. And I can pack four massive objects unwrapped into one texture. And then I can reference the RGBA channels and mix it with a grunge, which is also RGBA. And, but ultimately, these are really specific textures that you can start to blend together. So I'm, I'm now reading the mask, and then I'm enabling the art, which is specific to this asset. You do have to manage that. You have to know what it's going to apply to but then just mixing and matching and um, a huge amount of power because I can just use these grunge textures to bring detail to every single asset in a scene very quickly. And those mask um, textures, yes, they are unique and they are generated out of substance, but ultimately we are reducing textures by uh, a, how many masks can you fit into a, a channel packed texture? Um, you know, you can start to use quadrants and things like that. Um, it, it's a huge win for us. So that's the power of um, building your own shaders. Yeah, so guys, uh, ultimately, that's, um, that's it from me uh, and the team. We'll have questions uh, after a short demo. But I just want to encourage uh, anyone who's getting into VR or AR, um, there is huge potential, not just because um, you can replicate real world scenarios and put people into them, um, but by the time you, you get into VR, you'll, you'll see that the potential is, is there uh, to be found. And, and we're just scratching the surface now. A lot of stuff to keep in mind if you are building these yourselves. Um, but the, the challenges and uh, the rewards, um, yeah, they're all there for the taking. Cheers, guys. Central main line and points have been inspected. You're now authorized to proceed in main line, and I'll be doing a roll by inspection on your train. Over. Thank you, Krumo. Uh, thanks, Brian, Nick, and Brett. Uh, let's go ahead and take some time for Q&A now. Uh, just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in Zoom uh, if you haven't already. 
Um, so let me just have a quick look here at uh, questions. So Alex Dubry has asked, what other types of careers can use this? Okay, well, for, uh, for our solution specifically, we've been focusing on uh, heavy machinery equipment and process training. Uh, but in theory, you can, uh, you can use any, if for any career, I guess, that, um, that seems like a, a logical solution to, to use VR for. So it's, I guess, I guess the, f the first areas are like uh, any, any situation where you can recreate a scene or a scenario, um, you may require actors um, to perform a certain instance perfectly, or uh, you might want to create a high risk situation like uh, something being on fire or, you know, uh, avoid those dangerous situations in the field or, or situations you can normally never train for or very ideal for VR. Um, we've seen some amazing things happen in, um, in medical uh, practices, um, operations, being able to practice certain surgery. Um, there, there's so many applications for, uh, for this, but um, our, our team right now, our current focus on, uh, on our end is uh, process training for heavy machinery and that can include trains and transports and, and so on. Just, um, just based off the back of that, what are, the, what are some of the main benefits of, of using this style of training over the more traditional? You know, what, what, what are some of the rewards that your, your clients are, are seeing? I guess one of the real big ticket ones there is the, uh, the, the, the something that the client initially came in for uh, was uh, to, to, to reduce the reliance on operational stock by 50%. And uh, that, that sounded pretty bold initially, um, but I think we well and truly went beyond that. Uh, so so the, the actual issue there for the client was that they quite often during training situations they might not have the, uh, the train there available, or if they did, it would take quite a bit of time. Uh, and it was a very costly operation to have a whole consist ready. Their train with several wagons had to be pulled out of operation. It's also a risky situation. It would take you uh, quite a, you know, maybe let's say an hour and a half, two hours before you're actually with your training group there on location. So to have a shunt yard um, and operational stock there, right there and ready, um, even for remote delivery, that is, uh, that's your big ticket item. I think the, some of the other things we've noticed is that um, a huge improvement of confidence, um, people um, being recruited with more diverse backgrounds now have the ability to go over and over the training, um, proper uh, communications protocol. We, we looked at Nick's implementation of the communications there. The client is raving and the trainers are raving about how well the communications are now being applied uh, in the exact format. Um, so so that, that's just some of those. I mean, obviously um, being able to present faults, we, we found that um, when we were doing roll by inspection, when we were learning how to do roll by inspections, um, the trainer has sort of had to mime out the faults and I had to have a lot of imagination to, to imagine what these faults would look like and what I would be looking for. Um, and he said, yeah, well, you know, in about 10 years, you'll probably know all the faults. Um, so in VR, we can present all those faults on actual operational stock um, virtually. So uh, I think that's a huge improvement. Uh, that's where you can, um, can start taking, uh, I mean, that's not per se uh, only in VR, but uh, it, it's very uh, impressive at scale and for audits and inspections, uh, mm. very important. I remember I, would, I remember working on a project and um, uh, our customer was actually delivering their training through PowerPoint. Um, they actually found that what was more effective was actually having one of their experts in the room. Uh, the problem with that approach though is that it's completely not scalable. They were finding that they had to fly that expert to various locations around, around Australia and, and, and New Zealand. Um, whereas once we deployed using mixed reality, um, they actually found that it was incredibly scalable that, you know, you can deploy that, that training hundreds of thousands of times, you know, and you don't have to send that expert anywhere. Yeah, of course, of course, capturing, capturing your subject matter experts and capturing the ideal training session is, is, um, 
gold, of course, if it, it doesn't matter if it's VR or not, but when you can recreate a scenario in VR like that, that is, mm. uh, that's gold. Uh, that's a perfect segue into the next question, which is, you know, uh, and it's from Trent, Trent Yates. So he's asking, what is your workflow for moving from photogrammetry to a Unity scene? So how do you manage the poly count and the performance in VR? Hello, uh, this, I'm Brett. And uh, yeah, I think on that, for this particular project, we didn't rely on photogrammetry uh, for the final Product. We, we really did carefully want to control the, the number of polys. It's not as, it, it'd be nice if it was as simple as scanning it uh, and just decimating the, the scan into, you know, fewer triangles. But at the end of the day, we want very particular materials on very particular surfaces. We want to use very particular textures in those materials. Uh, so I just use my phone to capture a lot of photogrammetry. Um, I think I pushed it through uh, at the time might have been 3D flow. Uh, one of the lighter versions, you know, limited in, in the number of photos that you can take. But all I was really doing on that day was capturing the scene for reference uh, to make sure the scale was correct, to make sure because uh, engineering drawings still don't have everything uh, on it. Uh, a 3D CAD model might be newer than some of the stock that they're using out there on the rail. And at the end of the day, uh, we just needed the detail that was required to meet the, the training objectives. So if we scanned and used those scans as is, uh, it would be firstly too messy. And then if we decimated it, we still wouldn't have the right detail in the right places. Uh, so we really just use them to capture and, and establish scale uh, more than anything. But I, I would say that there are lots of other workflows out there for transferring scans to um, to Unity. We we yeah, just off, don't rely on them. Yeah. Off the back of that, just a just a plug on uh, some of our products. Uh, so Pixie, if if you guys are not aware, um, uh, for everyone that's out there, Pixie is a is a plugin that works with Unity and it allows for the the import of of assets and also uh, the destination and the optimization of them. Um, and uh, the other thing too is Pixie can also support point cloud data as well. Um, so what we'll do is there, there is a few kind of questions here. Um, Peter Moore, wow, awesome, not really a question. Uh, <laughs> group, group and Dace uh, was saying, are there any examples of how this could be applied to automobile? Uh, maybe we can move through this quickly then. Um, you know, an automobile or any asset could replace the train, you know? So, um, you know, well, that's positive. I mean that, that's an interesting one because not a big part of our business uh, handles the TMR and Tasmania, the theory driver, um, what do we call this, certification? No. Yeah, learner driver. Learner driver um, part. So uh, we've brought that online for Queensland, which means you don't have to go into um, TMR anymore to, to get your, um, your uh, theory part done. Um, there's also a huge part of um, Sort of behavior change in there, but um, we we actually use Unity for production of um, quite a few of those images, and that's all around cars and roundabouts and those type of situations. So have a look on uh, on our site and in the case studies, definitely a section on Prep L and Precinct as well as uh, well. So anonymous and attendee has asked why choose Unity over a certain other large game engine. Uh, Okay. For me, I've been using Unity for such a long time now that for me to go and reload another engine is quite a big effort. But I think there's more to it than just that. He's just saying, no, I only can use Unity. That's unfair. But um, I think portability is probably one of the big parts for us because it can export to such a wide array of platforms and it's really simple to do so. So that's one of the main reasons for yeah. continuing to use Unity. How good are the plugins as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. Such a good community. Which, to, to be honest, mm. yeah, we, we make uh, a decent amount of use of, of the plugins, but at the same time, um, I suppose if you're, it depends what you need it for. Like for, for example, Unity is just gonna get, get you uh, into VR and, and AR development with a pipeline that's that's ready to go. Like well, I didn't have to do that much more tweaking. Um, it, it, 
sort of got down into some of the project settings for that particular pipeline. But uh, I was incredibly impressed. And even at home when I um, build stuff for the Quest, it's, it's just um, click and go. So I, I yeah, I, I've used Unreal as well, but at the same time, I don't think we, uh, we're really comparing apples and oranges. You know, Unreal has its direction and, and Unity has its, and, and we're happy to stick with, with Unity for that reason. Yeah. Just uh, off the back of that as well, um, Unity has been partnering with a range of uh, different people around the world. So uh, there's great products out there, specifically if you wanted to get into mixed reality, there's a product by Light and Shadows called Interact. Um, we've got um, you know other products called Mars, AR Foundation. So we're really supporting mixed reality in a big way, which is really exciting. Um, mm. So uh, another anonymous question. So what advice would you give to instructional designers that are looking to move into um, you know, this type of career? Yeah, so I've got a bit of a background in it, in instructional design. Um, before that, some game designing. Um, the transition is, I, I found uh, is just, um, I mean, started working with Unity is a really good step. <laughs> not to not to give a Unity plug, but that's literally what I did. And start transferring uh, your ideas from what you know. If if a good instructional design works on paper, it works on anything, right? Um, but then approach your design as you would design a classroom-based or pra um, practice-based session. So. Because in Unity, you now have the ability to set, set an environment and then to go, what would I do in that environment with a teacher, with a bunch of students, and maybe with um, some props? And you design, um, you start your design around that. It depends on what kind of instructional design you do, but um, go back to what you know. And maybe if you're uh, used to designing based on slides, uh, or interactions within those slides and go, okay, right. So how about a slide is a scene? So in Unity, you develop that one scene is, or one part of the activity is uh, equal to a slide. Um, let's say normally you would have a drag and drop interaction in a certain part, then that could become something in a 3D space or using physics and so on. Um, so yeah, it's just start chip away at it and uh, start making that transition, uh, follow some videos that appeal to you and start putting it in practice. And I suppose on your point about um, rapid prototyping oh, yeah. and just being able to play with depth as well, just like spatially when it comes to, yeah. to ID and, and XD. Well, if you're used to, I mean, it's such an exciting area, right? If, if you're used to being an instructional designer and you're previously potentially maybe limited to the 2D sort of field, and suddenly you can you can take that and put it on steroids, right? You can add physics, you can add two and a half D, you can make it three D, you can um, you know, make it multi-user. So um, it's, it's very exciting times. It can be very overwhelming. So just take it one step at a time. Move move slowly, one step at a time away from uh, from what you're familiar with, and uh, go back to paper a lot. Uh, draw it out on paper. Uh, maybe um, don't try to if you're not inclined to do a lot of programming. Maybe um, steer away from C sharp. If you like programming, then fantastic, do it. And uh, there's plenty of visual scripting tools. Paul is, uh, is amazing. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I've got to say, I really like your approach of how you try to get your, your clients, your customers into VR as quick as possible. Um, you almost yeah. kind of sandbox the environment and then you start layering on top of that, you know, and expanding it outwards. I think it's a great approach. Um, as soon so as I can. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do have a few questions. So I'm just going to kind of rattle through this as quick as possible. Um, uh, please note, if we don't get to your question, we will revisit these and we'll, we'll, we'll type in answers and, and we'll get those out there to you. Um, so there's a good question by Tony Lee, wondering if Krumo has had any projects where you use VR or XR interfaces to control real hardware in real time. Um, if not, wondering how you guys would go about doing it. As far as I know, we've not done that, have we? Not explicitly. No, no. We, we've uh, probably the, the closest we've come is, I suppose, uh, matching a room. Uh, I, we worked for a client called DMC, uh, and we matched their sales suite, which was quite small. Uh, it hadn't been refurbished because this was a new uh, high rise in, in Brisbane CBD that was being refurbished or gutted. 
and uh, we had to set, uh, I suppose, uh, set up this virtual room to look like the sales suite and then blow it away to reveal the new building. Um, and so that was a little bit choreographed and, uh, and synced up to the actual space. I wouldn't, I, I, possibly you might be referring to sort of heading in, in, in a mixed reality or augmented reality or even internet direction thing. as well. Yeah, internet yeah. of things, yeah, connecting up and controlling devices Good. from within virtual reality. Uh, there's a lot of possibility there. Yeah, we've done some stuff with Connect, connect Camera as mm. well. So controlling avatars through Unity that um, use the video cam to turn you into that avatar, which is uh, a lot of fun. But we also use those trackers. Remember the Vive yeah. trackers onto a chair? And that was that was so funny because there was a 3D chair right there, but then the chair would be there in real life and the tracker would move the 3D chair and it, yeah, it just messed with your mind, so. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so D Jim Durkin uh, has asked the question, how would you cater for both high and, sorry, high end headsets and the Quest? So essentially a high end device, low end device, would you use the same project or would you use two different projects? Maybe start with one project and then kind of split it out. Uh, what would you guys do? Yeah, and uh, I've, Nick would probably be good to answer sort of the project side of things, but uh, our design uh, methodology is that we don't uh, we don't create assets to be used once. Um, these assets should work um, firstly in VR. That's that's especially for our training. But then those assets should work when we export them out as high res video. They should also work on the Quest and. Uh, probably the long story short is your LODs or your level of detail models can quickly become uh, your sliding rule for what sort of detail uh, a scene can handle. And you can obviously reuse any LOD level as something that works for a lower end device. Or you just start to turn off some of the features that um, are really nice to have or things that create depth, um, things that are create uh, make those experiences more immersive. So maybe you would reduce your real-time shadow um, depth uh, or, or radius. Uh, you might take some of the cascades out of your shadow to, to reduce quality sooner. You might turn it off if it's just not essential for training. Um, but I would say that we really wouldn't do too much differently with our assets, especially when our um, textures are, are quite, our materials and shaders are quite optimized. But uh, you've got that sliding rule. Uh, even textures, you can start to reduce their resolution if you absolutely have to. Um, tileable textures, does everything really need to have a mask to make it look so unique? Um, ideally, you can start to reuse those assets from the high end all the way to the lowest end. Uh, it just comes down to the client's request, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and what we're recommending. Even optimize the quality stuff. Yeah, so I'll talk to this point now. So. We've actually been trying to work out a better solution for doing VR for different platforms. So obviously Unity can support multiple platforms out of the gate, whether that is Android, iOS, and obviously desktop. And for the stuff we did for Horizon, we specifically just used aimed at desktop only and it was very integrated with Steam VR. And because it was integrated with Steam VR, we couldn't just change it to Android and pop it onto the Quest. And so that's one thing we've been working on is trying to sort of change our split the solution so you can sort of target any device. Um, in terms of the input, that's probably one of the biggest areas that you've got to factor in. And we've been using the new input system to you can sort of write all the different inputs per device and then it should just work. And so you've got to design your application in such a way that it's quite abstracted. So when you're in this context or this device, it's using this control scheme that's on this device, it's going to be this control scheme. And again, you can sort of do the same thing with loading in different assets. So dynamically loading assets depending on your platform. So if you had a platform that doesn't isn't as powerful, then you might low, load in the lower end asset. Whereas if you're on the higher end platform, then you have to load in the higher end asset. Yeah. Uh, so this next question is by Graham Walker. So have you found that your customers, um, oh, sorry, has your customers, have they had any resistance going into these these styles of experiences, immersive experiences? Oh, it's, it's one of my favorite anecdotes always. <laughs> is, uh, 
it's the uh, the the guys in the fields. You know, the, the, we we we're dealing with train drivers that were forty years in the field. They're highly respected. Um, they uh, they might have a mobile phone, but that's that's about where technology ends for them. And um, yeah, we we weren't necessarily let's say warmly received initially by some some of them. A little skeptic, bit of resistance, yeah. Yeah, like, health, healthy hmm. dose of dose of uh, skepticism. Skepticism, yeah. like yeah, it's okay, simulation that's not really going to work. Or how do you train this thing? Uh, now, these guys are now our biggest advocates. Yeah. To see them in VR is is just amazing. See see yeah, the typical you know train driver has been driving that train 40 years and they're in VR and they forget that they're not in the yard, that they're just in the virtual yard and pointing out like a couple of pistons and things like that. Mm. And they're just going through it and they're telling everyone about it. So yeah, most, mostly that's probably in the field. There's some people higher up, maybe initially skeptical, but generally this, uh, it's met with a lot of enthusiasm from, uh, from the early adopters and visionaries and uh, starts high up and then a whole team will come along especially we've got, we've got a lot of solutions we've been going for about 11 years now or so there's a lot of stuff we can, uh, mm. we can go and, and probably on that as well it might speak to uh oh, vr you know it'll make me sick or i'll get eye strain mm. or uh, something like that but that the great thing is that all of the uh, clients and all of their users, there is such a, so a minute um, number of people who actually report feeling sick, but it's actually the sickness is, it's like a car sickness or, or motion sickness. It depends what they're doing. And so we do everything we can to avoid moving them artificially. So it's always uh, free locomotion, room scale, virtual reality. Uh, we also, we have to ensure that our latency is as low as possible because as soon as you, you start to eat into, I suppose, that ceiling, you can kind of push it to 15 milliseconds uh, response time, but you want to bring it down to 10 because the longer you sort of play in that area, the more your, your brain is going to feel things aren't quite right, uh, as well as teleporting and, and making sure that things are comfortable. There were a few edits uh, in our video where it shows you zooming from teleport point to teleport point it was just so you didn't have to watch us, you know, teleport three times. So uh, we're not zooming people from A to B. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can. There's lots of white papers out uh, as well on your vestibular and how that affects um, uh, motion sickness and things like that. And we have a very, very high, uh, we're very proud of um, yeah, the, the quality and the lack of reported sickness from, from VR, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I guess some people were skeptical about some of the drivers behind these programs. Like, uh, was the company just aiming for cost efficiency? And that wasn't the case. So the training became way more efficient and less reliant on the frustration of having to wait on operational stock and so on. And that means that the training, the, the training time was still as long, but the, the, what you were trained at was maybe five times the amount as previously so the people coming out of that training would be um, way way more skilled and confident way more confident and i think uh, way better tested and prepared to to go out in the field and i was met with a lot of um i guess uh, was met really well by the unions and by the trainers by, by all sorts yeah cool so uh the next question is by bradley hammond uh this is probably more for uh, people wanting to maintain their projects so what source control solution do you use and uh wh what are the main source control complications that you find when you're developing the unit ah uh, very good question that one so we're using um, bitbucket for our version control and obviously that means we're using git um git lfs is so crucial for our product so basically any binary asset which is like gigabytes in size is going to be stored in that size so i guess the main thing is you just have to make sure that when you're setting up the project that you basically say these types of binary assets are going to be stored in git lfs or else you're going to be running out of space in your git repository very quickly we've had that issue before in another project where the git storage part gets maxed out and you can't go any further you have to reverse your commits or just start again essentially so it's just start a new repository so but that's uh that's because of pesky 3d guys um, <laughs> pushing way too many large binary files when they shouldn't 
Um, I've got, got to say, I've worked as a creative myself as well, and I've, I've found, you know, Bit to, uh, and Git, sorry, to be uh, a little bit challenging to use as a, as a creative, um, you know, uh, personally. Um, just one thought around that. Um, Unity has made a recent acquisition. So there's, uh, uh, we recently purchased a company that makes a product called Plastic Source Control Manager. Uh, it's in beta at the moment. You can download it on the asset store. Um, and also as a creative, I really like that you're able to go in there and, and um, you know, control the assets, you know, and actually revert back to older assets as well. So um, so out there to, to everybody that's kind of viewing this webinar, please check it out. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, so hopefully that addresses some of the collaboration. Mm. So yeah, I mean, one of the really strong features of, uh, of working with something like that is that um, of when you don't lose um, work, which is always great, <laughs> but um, you can work in a branch. Uh, yeah. uh, that's super powerful. Once you once you get your head around that, you um, you're able to. Uh, so I, I go and do some testing, create some UI, and then mix the administrator and goes, yeah, that all looks pretty good. So we merge it, merge our branches, and then goes back to the main branch. So that's uh, super powerful. Yeah. So the next question by Ryan Noonan. He works with high school students. What VR packages would you recommend to get them started? Um, would you use uh, STEM VR, mixed reality toolkit? You know, what are your thoughts? I haven't used many of those packages myself, so I can't really give any personal recommendation at, at this stage. But you know, I think there's stuff on the asset store, for example, which probably is a good start in terms of you down, download it and then just sort of set up the project exactly how you want it to be. And once you start to need more functionality, then I'd say then you might branch out and doing something different. Mm. I would go with some of the essentials. I mean, depending on what they want to learn, but uh, Bolt is, uh, of course, an incredibly good uh, area to start. So the visual scripting, unless uh, you have some people keen to program, and Bolt can, um, the visual scripting can still be a really good gateway into um, C sharp programming. And I guess combining it with uh, what, what's the Unity um, XR VR mm. set they have at yeah, the moment? Yeah. yeah, so you've already got your. Um, package that you can enable for XR development. Yeah, yeah, there are and actually, open XR is coming. With keep, keep it simple initially. Have some small projects and, and uh, use some visual scripting around that. Oh, yeah, I suppose to go back to XR specifically, like I suppose it is a little bit fragmented at the moment in terms of so many different solutions. So, like there's Open XR, which is effectively being deprecated from 2020.1 onwards, and so that's basically everything that Steam VR is no longer compatible with. So you have Although I know they are working on a solution at this very stage, and I'm not sure if it's quite ready yet. And so obviously there's that complexity, and so it really depends on what sort of headset you're working with as well that will determine what solution you're going to work with. Yeah, yeah. I think for any of those questions as well, um, my contact details will be will be up there. So just email me, and I can get some answers to you guys. Um, the other thing too is for the community out there, um, Unity Learn Premium. So if you do a Google search for Unity Learn Premium, uh, it used to be a paid resource. Uh, it's now free. Anyone can go in there. There's some really excellent tutorials and videos, um, you know, specifically if you want to learn VR, mixed reality, there's a lot of really good uh, helpful tips um, and, and tutorials that, that are available there. Um, all right, so we probably need to wrap up in about five minutes or so. Let me just go to a couple of other ones here. So um, some of these are quite similar. Oh, here's a question by Toby Loverbridge. So hi, how big is your development team? Not, not too much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we've, uh, we've got we Dineth and then Peter. Uh, so in terms of 3D artists, uh, we're up to three full-time and two contracts and, and there's two programming and this is another guy that we've got on our team and not in the room with us so we have two instructional designers now we're project manager so so roughly let's say it's somewhere between 12 and it's going to 12 and 15 and um those resources shared over uh, over different projects i think the whole company including compono is uh, 98 at the moment um Kumo itself about 30 or so yeah so uh so it kind of shifts but um, I think generally, it, you know, if, if you're at very early stages, maybe a team of four, three or four can, can sort of manage. We, we did a lot of little projects also, uh, two people. Once you get to your bigger enterprise projects, you're mostly looking at eight to 12 um, 
people need it. And, and we, we've got a really unique uh, combination of skill sets, right? We've got some 3D animators, or some real triple A sort of studio, studio here. Um, we're quite lucky with, uh, with a broad set of uh, skill sets and, uh, and resources. So it just depends what you're aspiring to do, I guess. Uh, so here's a question by Jim Durkin. So basically saying, how do you generate your animated helpers? Uh, are you using things like Mixamo, for instance? We're talking about uh, characters specifically, or we're talking about assets. Um, I think in one of the videos that Byron showed, he was just using Character Creator yep. um, from iClone, uh, Reillusion. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, we we don't just want to use any any kind of character. They've definitely got to um, be built for the distance that you'll use in that. So um, we're just in another project already, um, and yeah, we're, we're designing the character very specifically. All their PPE, um, the, the personal protective equipment, um, everything about them is dialed in for the distance that, that they'll be seen from in VR. Yeah. And we have in-house motion capture. Yeah, um, in-house motion design, capture. Yeah. Um, and of course, Unity's, like I use Unity all the time for little short films and things where I'm just using Timeline and Cine Machine and just sort of layering Cine clips machine. over the top of each other. and. Mm -hmm. Um, moving the little root um, motion position and blending all these complex motion captured clips that I didn't make. There's huge free libraries out there. Uh, and then you can apply that to any any kind of character biped or, um, yeah, it's, it's super flexible. And um, some people on the store have really good um, character sets to buy as well. Yeah, I'm heaps. a big fan of character creator myself for prototyping. So okay. a small team to medium teams can use character creator. So we've got a question by Christopher Lawanga. So how much photogrammetry or other ways of getting the physical into the virtual do you use versus creating the assets from scratch? So is there an advantage in creating the 3D assets from scratch? That's kind of the question. Yeah, I, I did touch on this, uh, one of the first questions, I think. And um, it, it's not to say we don't use photogrammetry, but so far our primary use has been for scale. Uh, we do like to control, very precisely control our poly counts. Um, and not to mention when it comes to uh, textures and all the unique textures that photogrammetry usually requires. Uh, that's not to say you can't start using masks to, uh, an in Substance Painter to then blend um, tileable textures back onto those photogrammetry assets. Um, but for the work we do, we, we just don't need um, photogrammetry captured assets just yet. We, we do require highly accurate engineer specific uh, measurements to, to work on these models rather than some of the inconsistencies and, and imperfections that photogrammetry can, can bring. So short answer, no, we're not, we're not really using extensive photogrammetry. Uh, we, we, you know, we've done um, mining, open cut mine walls, and we've taken a lot of photogrammetry from that and used them as is, uh, reduced, uh, decimated their, their poly counts right they down. You say uh, drone for that, right? So yeah, drone, drone footage. Um, yeah, I think photogrammetry is much better for like natural mm. environments, as mm. you say, caves mm. and, and mines and whatnot, yeah. Yeah. for man-made mechanical structures. No, we, we've done a quite a bit of accident recreation as well in our time. And, and then photogrammetry is very useful to, to capture um, yeah, as much data for reference, of course, to yeah. recapture what happened during an accident or uh, yeah, you need those exact sizes. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very keen to, uh, to play around with um, Pi XYZ a little bit more. And um, I think point clouds, the way it's heading, um, you know, he can throw a lot of detail or keep a lot of detail and, and sort of get your dense point clouds only where you need them. So I'm pretty keen to, uh, to play with, with that more, but for the most part, when it comes to hard surfaces and collisions and moving objects and all that kind of stuff, when it comes to training, yeah, we're, we're yeah. still keeping it uh, pretty controlled. And the philosophy as well as that, that whole build it once and use many, and generally that means you have to build it um, to optimize it. So ideally we can go the whole range from HTML uh, to iPad, to desktop, to VR, to AR. So that requires building your models in a very clever way. Yep. 
So we've got a question here around, I've seen videos of hand tracking VR. Now this is by, by February Anto Amir, sorry, Amri Ristardi. Uh, so I've seen videos of hand tracking VR. How difficult is that compared to the one demoed in this webinar? We've, um, VR. So, so just using it's probably the hand, Oculus Quest, you know. Yeah. 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 Just, just using the hand as a controller. So, actually, um, we, we, some of our most cutting edge R and D stuff is around multi user and multi platform multi user, and I, that's so much fun. Just mm. the four of us being in different locations, jumping in the same scene. But um, a couple of us will uh, will wear a, a, a Quest. One will be on a tablet. One will be on a desktop, and one will be wearing HTC Vive and Vive Pro and Vive Pro I. And um, the Quests generally show off their yeah. hand hand movements. Um, so. This is uh, we're, we're just getting down to input, right? And then as a designer, like what do we, how do we do what we normally use a button for? Mm. What do we do with our fingers? So, yeah, I haven't done hand tracking with the Oculus Quest myself. I've used the um, Leap Motion in the past, which I guess is kind of similar. Because I think the easy part is sort of getting a skeleton and then you can sort of move like a object, whether that's your hand, but then going from there and sort of doing something tangible where you sort of if you have like an object here and then sort of grabbing that, that's going to be a lot trickier. But mm. there probably is something out on the app store, perhaps, that someone's been working on. I've seen like all the demo issues, there's people working on stuff. So, presumably, people are going to be starting to release their tools out on the Well, yeah, well, even one tool already on the Unity store is uh, when you chuck your quest on, uh, you can simply grab objects and then capture the skeleton of the hand at that point, which basically you can get a, a mesh snapshot, uh, which becomes your morph targets for um, hand positions on really specific stuff. Instead of having to pose all the bones, when you get close, your hand starts to, you know, suit the object exactly how it's going to grip something. So, yeah, pretty cool. There's some really interesting potential benefits to it, especially if you uh, do a large scale rollout for an enterprise or so. Let's say we're, we're rolling out, you know, 100 Oculus Quests or so, um, then if you don't have the service, all the controllers, um, that might be a really um, good good push for, for trying to uh, convert your um, activity to hand tracking. And also it's it's already a bit future-proof for, uh, for AR then because AR, I mean, there's most likely you're not gonna be walking around with a controller or two controllers for AR. So, if you design your solutions now around hand tracking, it's probably a pretty good bet for the future. I, I, what we'll do is uh, we'll have one more question, but before we get to that, I really like how you guys, uh, you know, as soon as we started talking about hand tracking, you started talking about like how this, excuse me, opens up the world of opportunity around multiplayer experiences. Um, and, and we had a few people asking about that question. So in, in essence, you've kind of answered that already, but I do, I personally believe that, you know, this, this social interaction and the ability of have mul multiple people in the same experience at the same time to be quite uh, amazing, you know, and, and is going to be quite rewarding. So um, it's good to see that you guys are, you know, sharing that, that same, you know, enthusiasm. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the new stuff that you guys produce, uh, specifically in those areas. Um, I guess um, just with regards to um, just a final question, I'm just trying, I'm just having to look through them now. Um, just to let you know, we've got about 39 questions that have been left unanswered. So um, it's been a pretty, <laughs> pretty popular, pretty popular session, which is great. Uh, I'm just having a quick look through here. I'm not sure if you guys have access to the questions either, but maybe if, you, okay. if you're able to take are you able to take a quick look at them and see if you could pick one out? It's almost like a raffle at the moment. About the marine industry up there, that could be interesting. Okay. Yeah, let's do marine. that one. This is marine fluid dynamics. Oh, that's right up early, right? Um, a couple of years ago now on a certain project, we worked on fluid dynamics. So the question is, I work in the marine industry. Are there, are there any use cases in marine? Um, I'd imagine it would be difficult to simulate fluid dynamics and movement of water and its effect on a vessel. Um, uh, probably uh, one of our clients is actually um, Switzer in the marine industry. Um, Brett, fluid dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
I suppose, yeah, um, Barn is referencing, we, we've done uh, fluid dynamics or uh, aerodynamics simulations in Houdini. And um, we've, we've translated that via VDB volumes um, straight into Unity. And because they're baked and because obviously you can do a lot of permutations outside of Unity, bake them out and save them and then crush them down or uh, basically optimize them, you can have, I think we ended up with 256, because uh, probably a little bit more context, uh, doing real-time fluid dynamics in VR is, is crazy. Um, firstly, because of the amount of time you would have to wait for every actual frame to be calculated, let alone have a wing in a, a fluid volume moving, let alone having those, those foils and flaps uh, changing the air movement to increase lift or uh, show where drag is occurring. So do it offline. Uh, and then we used Houdini, we, we brought it straight through and uh, played it in real time in Unity. So then uh, the devs applied controls to the wing going through the motions of the wing playing in real time as those particles they're updating and adapting uh so yeah it's it's po it's definitely possible yeah um i mean there's two to, parts to what level two, two parts like that like i mean fluid dynamics not the the probably the most interesting part about um training process um in in marine right but we can definitely do it we can do it up to a level where you know, if you were required to understand the impact of certain waves on your vehicle, and you want to understand that at scale while your head's basically in the wave, and you see the impact on that or on your aerial vehicle or, or anything like that, yeah, we did, yeah, you, know, you can sky's the limit, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, That's awesome, question. guys. So uh, look, thanks, Byron, Nick, and Brett. Um, I think we're well over time. Um, I just want okay. to thank everybody. Uh, you guys have done an amazing job. Um, we appreciate our community joining us and many thanks to the team at Crumo. Um, just a reminder that we'll be posting a recording of today's session on the YouTube channel. Uh, so please take a moment to fill out our survey. Uh, we've just got that QR code up there now, as well as the bit.ly link. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch. Uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. guys. Yeah. Some great questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so too.